So Justin is from um, the Arthur Ryler Institute and he's an aquatic biologist specialising in all aspects of the ecology of freshwater fish. Um, he works in the Applied Aquatic, aquatic that's why I don't work for them, the Applied Aquatic Ecology Group at the Arthur Ryler Institute. Um, he's got over 20 years experience in research, assessment and conservation of freshwater ecosystems and he's specialised particularly in river restoration research and threatened species assessment and management. Um, not only that, he's authored numerous articles published in international journals um, on topics ranging from fish movement, flow requirements of threatened fish species um, to the impacts of fire on aquatic ecosystems. So you can tell from that that we've got a really amazing expert speaker tonight. So we're very lucky to have Justin come along and talk to us. And tonight he's going to talk to us um, about the fish species you might find in um, Victorian estuaries and um, his own work local to this area on the recent installation of a fish ladder on the Barwon River that's <coughs> helping thousands of fish move upstream. So um, join me in welcoming Justin. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, look, tonight I'm just going to talk about some of the estuarine fish species you'll find throughout Victoria. Um, and then I'll talk about how we sort of tend to group them according uh, for management in according to how they... Um, uh, their needs require, well, net requirements around the estuary are. Um, then I'm going to talk about some of the local estuaries around here, and particularly about the Barwon River estuary, which is one of the biggest estuaries <coughs> um, in Victoria, and, uh, and some work that we were doing there on a barrier in that, um, in that estuary, and the impacts of that barrier on the estu estuary and the estuarine fish community, and some recent work that the CMA undertook to um, rectify that. So on a rough count, on a map, I reckon there's um, over 100 estuaries within Victoria, the vast majority of them are small to medium-sized estuaries, probably similar to Spring Creek, which is down near Jan Juck, and the Thompson um, Creek ones, uh, located between here and Barwon Heads. Then you've got those bigger estuaries like the Barwon River estuary um, up at Barwon Heads. And, I mean, you've got the things like the Glenelg, um, the Snowy River, the Tarwin River and Anderson Inlet, and those larger estuaries, there's probably about 20, 20 or so of them throughout the state. So the majority are small to medium-sized of those hundred. Now, within those estuaries, there's actually about 170 fish species that you might encounter in them. But the vast majority of them are, uh, are not common and they're not abundant. They're pretty much just marine fish that are poking their heads into the estuary. But of the common and abundant fish species you'll find in the estuaries, there's probably about 30 or 40 of them. And this is a list of some of the better known ones, and I'm sure you'll uh, recognise some of those um, names. So what we do for management purposes, we tend to um, group these into guilds of fish depending on what requirements, that, what they require from the estuary. And these are the five sort of groupings that we use. So we have estuarine resident right through to freshwater diadromus. And I'll just go through each of those um, individually, explain what they are. So here, just here you have the marine waters over here. You've got your estuary here and freshwater inflows here. And these are your estuarine resident fish species. These fish species complete their entire life cycle within the estuary. Um, they, they occasionally go out to sea after a high flow event. You might find some out there, but they quit, pretty quickly return back to the estuary. And they'll occasionally go into fresh water. For some, some, some of them go in there, we think, to get rid of parasites and stuff like that. But all aspects of their life history is completed within the estuary, and they're totally dependent on the estuary to complete their life history. <laughs> so here's a group of some of those fish species that are um, estuarine resident. And I'll just talk a bit more about black brim. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this species. It is by far the most abundant and common large-bodied estuarine fish species in Victoria. It's really widely um, distributed um, all across the state and over the, all the way over to Western Australia. Um, and it's a very popular angling species. So, as I said before, this fish remain, um, largely remains in the estuary its entire life. And occasionally we'll go out to sea, uh, particularly after a high flow event, but it pretty much gets its way back in fairly quickly. And they will go into fresh water, and we think that's about getting rid of parasites. The adults spawn between August and December, and that's a fairly wide opening for spawning. Um, and it depends on where they are located, whether in WA or Victoria. But even within Victoria, there's a big, a big wide window for their spawning. And that's probably associated with getting the right environmental um, um, variables right for the spawning to occur and one of them is about spawning in the salt wedge. So this is the salt wedge of the estuary so basically that's and I'm sure many of you are aware of this but basically you get the denser salt water being flushed into the estuary by the tide 
and then you have the less dense fresh water coming from da um, upstream, downstream. And they basically form a wedge within the estuary, separated by this halocline layer. Basically, these are really important for a lot of estuarine fish species because they spawn within this salt wedge. There's a couple of reasons for that. There's a really good food supply, particularly in this halocline layer, um, of zooplankton and stuff like that. So when the eggs uh, hatch, there's lots of food sitting there ready for them to get into. The other thing about it is that the actual, uh, the buoyancy of the eggs is, means that they stay within the salt water, um, salt water layer. And that's a really good thing because if they get washed into that uh, freshwater layer, they'll actually get washed out to sea and they won't be able to complete their life cycle. So they're two of the reasons why this salt wedge is really important. One of the things we've been trialling lately in Victoria, up in the Werribee River and also down the Latrobe River, we've been using environmental flows to try and enhance recruitment and spawning of this species. And we're doing that. So basically environmental flows, it's about releasing water uh, from upstream freshwater storages downstream to coincide with certain life history traits of a fish and to uh, try and enhance their spawning or their dispersal or recruitment. And what we're doing, we're doing some trials of releasing water from in the Werribee and Latrobe to try and um, expand this salt water wedge to make it as long as we can to increase the spawning habitat and therefore improve um, recruitment. And the other thing that we're doing is that that salt water wedge moves up and down the estuary with the tide and with the fresh water inflows. And what we find is if that saltwater wedge is placed over estuarine seagrasses, that also enhances recruitment. Because once those larvae are finished sort of feeding on those zooplankton, they fall out into this sort of habitat. And if you can place that saltwater salt wedge over this type of habitat when they're falling out, we once again, uh, we're getting much better improved recruitment. On to the next species, so estuarine opportunists. So these guys, basically they can complete their life cycle wholly within the um, sea. They don't need to come into the fresh water, but they do, and they do in large numbers sometimes. And they're opportunistic, and it's probably around about feeding. Estuarine um, waters are usually fairly productive, and so they'll come in and feed on other fish and stuff like that. But yeah, so uh, they don't need to come into the estuary, and they can complete their whole life cycle at sea. And these are typical of these sorts of things like salmon and mullet and trevally. And you know, you see lots of these fish within, especially the larger estuaries, but they don't need to be there and they can completely do fine just out in the sea and they can complete their life cycle without going into the estuary. Unlike these guys, the estuarine dependent. So these guys, while they don't spend their entire life in the estuary, they are dependent on the estuary to complete their life cycle. But the other part of their life cycle will be completed at sea. So, for example, they might spawn at sea and then the young come into the estuary for nursery habitats and for feeding, or vice versa, they may spawn in the estuary and that might act as nursery habitats and then the adults go out to sea to disperse and spawn elsewhere in other estuaries or whatever. Justin, yeah. um, what's the difference in quality from types of fish? Look, out of those 170 species, the vast majority of them are a thing called marine stragglers, which I'm going to get onto in a moment. Yeah. Of the others... Um, it's fairly evenly broken. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Probably, um, yeah, it's probably a fairly even break. I mean, I reckon there's about 30 or 40 fairly common and abundant estuarine species. And they're probably fairly uh, evenly broken up between the dependents, the, re uh, the residents and the opportunists. Marine stragglers make up the vast majority of those other 170. Yeah, right. And then we've got some other species, uh, those freshwater diatribus, which I'll go into later. And there's probably be about... I think there's 16 or 17 of them within Victoria. Okay. So I'll go on to here, and these are the typical examples of those estuarine dependent species. And I'll give you a bit of a case study on Mulloway. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this species. It's really widely distributed within Australia and around the world. Um, within Australia, you get it from New South Wales, right around the coast through Victoria, South Australia, and up into Western Australia. Um, and around the world, you get it. Um, distributed in South Africa, India, China, Korea, um, places like that. It's a really um, important angling species. In many of these other countries around the world, it's also an uh, important um, food, food species. This species spawn in November to January. Um, in Victoria, they tend to be about two to three years old when they're mature enough to spawn. But over in WA, they sort of more about four or five years of age before they spawn, and we're not quite sure why that is. Um, they spawn, they don't, we don't think they spawn in the estuary, we're pretty sure they spawn outside in the, in the ocean, but we think they've spawned fairly close to shore. They're not, you know, they're not miles out offshore. Once they've spawned, the juveniles come into the estuary. 
um, where there's nursery habitats and there's abundant food supply. And basically they come in, we're not quite sure about it, but anywhere from four weeks right up to about 12 months after they've been spawned. So we've had sort of young ones up in New South Wales coming in around four weeks. Typically in Victoria, it's probably more like about 12 months they're coming into the estuary. They stay in the estuary until they're mature. So in Victoria, that's two to three years of age. WA, it might be four to five years of age. And then once they're mature, they tend to take off and they'll take off out into the sea and they'll go to other estuaries and they'll move around the place. So for example, down in the um, Glenelg River, we had a study going on down there where we were putting acoustic tags into the, um, these fish. And I think we had 20 tagged fish. Of those 20 tagged fish, three of them actually left the Glenelg estuary, went out and were picked up over in the Coorong, which is the mouth of the Murray River, uh, by some uh, receivers that the South Australians had in over there. And look, and then they came all the way back. So it's over 800 kilometre round trip. And so to so expend that sort of energy, we suspect it's an important movement. We think it's probably tied in with, um, with spawning. And another thing of those fish that we had tagged down there, we, another fish went over to the Coorong, but it was caught by an angler before it could actually get in there. So we um, found out about it as well. So yeah, so some big large movements going on um, with these species between um, the sea and the estuary and between estuaries. This is that other species I was talking, uh, the other sort of guild of fish we're talking about, the marine straggler. And of those 170 species you get in the, in the estuary, these are by far make up the majority of them. And these are fish that totally live in the, um, the, the sea. They really are sea, you know, are marine fish. But, you know, they're, they're moving around and they're poking their heads into estuaries now and again. You don't find them in, um, you, they're not common in estuaries and they're not abundant in estuaries. But they make up a large majority of the, um, the actual diversity of fish you might find in an estuary. And these are typically things like, um, you know, gummy shark, flatheads, leather jackets. But really, it's probably any coastal marine fish species um, that lives near shore at some stage or another will stick its head into an estuary. And um, that makes up the majority of that 170. Then the fifth, um, the fifth uh, group of fish that will utilise the estuaries are the freshwater diadromous species. And there's sort of two life history cycles going on here. You've got the Chupong, Grayling and Glaxid species. And basically what happens with those guys is the adults live in the freshwater and they spawn in the freshwater. But then the little larvae get washed out to sea and they go out to sea for the first six months of their lives. And then they come, so they're travelling through the estuary to get out to sea. And then they come back in about six months later and they come through the um, estuary and they go back into fresh water where they remain for the rest of their lives and they start the whole cycle again. But then you've got the other um, sort of life cycle of these diadromous species and that's the lampreys. So what happens with the lampreys, they, they'll spawn in the freshwater reaches, usually up the top of the tributaries in gravelly sort of um, gravel beds. Uh, and the young stay in the freshwater and they grow and mature in the freshwater. And once they've matured and they're sort of two to three years of age, they go out to sea and they actually become parasitic. And um, you'll often see them on television, on docos and stuff, these sort of ear-like things attached to um, sharks and things like that. And that's, that's what those lamprey are. And that's one here. And you can see here, this is the parasitic phase and this is called the oral disc. And all these rasping teeth, that's what they attach to their prey, um, to their um, victims on or whatever you want to call them, sharks or whatever. And then they rasp away and they feed off that animal for probably two or three years. And then eventually they'll come back into fresh water as adults, um, usually in spring, and then they'll head back up right up to the top of the tributaries and they'll start spawning in those gravelly sort of beds and start the whole cycle over again. And then the adults die after spawning. So just some of the local estuarine waters around here. So we're here in Torquay. So we've got Spring Creek just down here. And then up here towards um, Bowen Hedge, you've got the Thompson Creek. And then up here, you've got Barwon Heads and the Barwon River. And like I said before, that's one of the biggest estuaries in the state. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail about that in a minute. But just on Spring Creek and um, Thompson Creek, here's some of the fish. I just had a look at the database at work, and here's some of the fish species, with estuarine fish species we've found in there. You know, black brim, not surprising. Like I said, they're really widely distributed and they're quite common in all estuaries. But you're getting things like flounder and salmon and hardy head and mullet in them. And then in the Thompson Creek, which is a slightly larger estuary, you're getting those estuary perch as well. And one of the things about these waters, they'll also all contain those diadromous fish species that I talked to you about. So those diadromous fish species will be going through them on their way down to the estuary as larvae and then coming back as juveniles. And that leads me on to the next part of my talk, which is um, around the Barwon River. 
estuary, and in particular a barrier or a weir that was uh, built on the Barwon River. And that weir forms a barrier to fish movement. And you think about those diadromous species that are going up and down and getting back into fresh water, weirs and barriers are a real issue with those guys because they can't get back upstream. And they're doing these annual migrations where they need to get back upstream into fresh water. And if they don't, they can't complete their life cycle. So barriers are a real problem. And so I just want to talk about the barrier that was on the, um, on the Barwon River. So the Barwon River, um, this barra, it was a barrage and it was basically constructed over 100 years ago. And it was built to stop the salt water incursions upstream. And so they wanted um, the water for drinking, they wanted it for irrigation. So they put this barrage in, this weir or barrier, to stop the water in going further upstream. And so it's located near Geelong, it's about 15 kilometres downstream of Geelong. So historically, the Barwon River ba um, estuary would have actually gone up another 15 kilometres than it does now. And these are the sort of, um, so this is just the location of it. So we're down here in Torquay somewhere. So here's Barwon Heads, there's the um, Barwon River, Lake Coonawari. Geelong, and the Barwon Barrage is located here. And so historically, this sort of 15 kilometres of stream or river that went up to Geelong would have been estuarine where it's at now um, salt, well, it's now fresh water. So all those estuarine fish species, which I'll show you later on that they inhabit these areas, would have historically had inhabited all this area up here and we've missed and lost that habitat due to this structure. So it's not very high, but you can imagine some small little diadromous fish species coming upstream and hitting that. It's not going to be able to swim above it. What happens historically is if that migration happens to coincide with a, a, a flood or where it gets drowned out, the fish can get upstream. So they do get upstream periodic, periodically, but not that often. This particular structure hasn't been drowned out for about three and a half years. So for the last three and a half years, in the absence of any rectifications, none of those diadromous fish species would have got upstream. So whilst it doesn't look much, it does cause a lot of, uh, a lot of grief. So upstream of here is all fresh water, and like I said, historically, that would have been all salt water all the way up to Geelong. And downstream of here is um, estuarine and salt water. It's usually fairly salty, depending on what the tide's doing and what the inf or fresh water inflows are doing. But um, quite often, it's, um, it's equivalent to seawater in the middle of summer when there's, you've got a high tide and not much fresh water coming. It's almost equivalent to seawater. Um, but yeah, so it ranges, but it's, it's usually quite salty. And down through here, this is a pool, pool just downstream of it, you get lots of estuarine fish species in here, which I'll go into a bit later on. So yeah, so look, the, the impacts of that barrier, one, it's a barrier to fish movement. <clears throat> it's particularly those diadromous fish species, those little guys trying to get back up in the fresh water. Um, and like I said, it doesn't drown out that often. It hasn't been drowned out for about three and a half years. But big, the other one is a habitat barrier. So as I've already described, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, stopping, it's, you know, it's stopping the estuary getting a further 15 kilometres upstream, which it historically would have, and therefore it also stops all those uh, fish species that would have historically all gone up to um, Geelong. Um, uh, when they put fish ladders in at uh, the weirs and things, yep. how high are those? That was only a very short yeah. step. Yep. I presume that the fish ladders are a step that you're something on step, wasn't it? No, no. Much smaller. Much smaller. I mean... Um, it's like the American fish ladders, when you're talking about salmon and that, they might get over something like that, but Australian fish can't jump. They actually swim, whereas American fish actually jump out of the water. Well, the salmon do anyway. Um, so, I mean, years and years ago when they started the fish passage program in Australia, which is probably the early 80s, they were putting in american design fishways, and they just weren't efficient at moving Australian fish species. So, yeah, it's far too much for Australian fish. Um, and we need a lot less than that, sort of probably 50, for the sort of little species we're speaking here, and I'll talk about it in a moment, probably 50 to 70 mil jumps, drops. And I'll go into the fish, fish ladders in a minute. But these are all the sort of fish species you get below that weir, and they're the ones that would typically and historically have gone all the way up to Geelong, but no longer do, and it's now inhabited purely by freshwater species. So how do you fix it? Well, obviously, removal's the way to go. One, it just removes the barrier, fish can go up and down, and it's a winner. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, and, and the other thing, of course, it removes the, uh, the barrier to the estuarine water going upstream, so it would reinstate the estuary 15 kilometres upstream, which it um, historically would have been. But as I mentioned, there's people irrigating out of that water still, so they couldn't do that. So the next best, best thing was to put in a fishway. And basically, a fishway is just a structure built alongside a weir or a barrier that um, rather than say for example a one metre jump it does incremental jumps 
of it might do 10, you know, 50, 50 mil jumps instead of one one metre or something, or one, uh, 10, 100 mil. Um, and it basically breaks it up into smaller jumps that the fish um, that we have in Australia can handle. Here's an example of a couple of fishways. This is called a rock ramp fishway, and this is actually one that was built, this is the Bowen River Barrage. So downstream salty, upstream fresh. This is a photo from the early 90s. This was built there in the early 90s, and it looks like a pile of rocks going around the edge here. But basically what it is, it's, it's a series of rocks and, um, and built up to a, a, small, a series of small jumps like that between 50 and 70 mil that the swimming ability of our fish species are able to handle. And so you have these incremental jumps going up through here rather than this one metre high sort of jump that you have over here. And the fish, that, that was designed around the swimming ability of our fish species. Now this thing worked really, really well for a couple of years. We had tens of thousands of fish utilising it sometimes. Um, but a big high flow event came through about two years after it was put in and it really knocked around the, um, the rocks and moved all the rocks and it became fairly non-functional after that. So the other thing with that, that fishway is that they're not, they're, if they're not built right, they're not that stable. And the other thing is you can see it's not that deep. And down here there were a couple of larger body fish species that we want to move, including mullet and estuary perch. And they may struggle in the depth here. It might not be quite deep enough for them. So the other type of fishway which we considered, and this is actually the Bowen River Barrage getting built, but this is a, this was a good photo to show what they look like. This is a vertical slot fishway. So it's basically a concrete channel, once again separated by these concrete baffles. And if you can see in between there's a small slot, and I think it's about 50 to 100 mil, like that, that the fish can swim through. So, all the, so once again, it's just these little incremental jumps of about 75 millimetres all the way up here. And the sort of velocities that are going through each of these slots are the sort of velocities that our Australian fish species can handle. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's the vertical slot fish wave. How long does it take them to move from one end to the other? Um, on that one, I'm not sure. That, no, actually, that would be about, I'm just trying to think of the other stuff, maybe an hour and a half? Yeah, yeah, maybe an hour and a half. Some will move through quicker than that. Some will move through slower than that, but an hour and a half would do it. So when it comes to building the fishway, so they're really the two options we had down at the Bowen River Barrage was the rock ramp or the vertical slide. So our objectives were really around um, these small body juvenile, sort of small body natives, and they're those diagenous species I was talking about. But also we thought that there were some larger species, including estuary perch and mullet, which are largely um, estuarine species, but they do inhabit freshwater reaches of rivers. And so we we're also hoping to get these fish moving through and up into the freshwater reaches of the river. So on, that, on those objectives, we went with the, um, the vertical slot. One, because they're more resilient to high flow events and moving and stuff like that, unlike the rock ramps. But it also, importantly, it maintains a good depth for these larger fish species to be able to um, go through. So what we did, we, there was a fairly unique construction that the um, CMA undertook, and it was a, um, a precast concrete structure. They made the vertical slot fishway out of a precast concrete structure. Um, traditionally you would make these, form these up and pour the concrete and that sort of stuff and it's really expensive and um, takes quite a long time to build them. Using this it's only a short construction period, it only took eight days to put it up and it's relatively cheap compared to the, um, the traditional way you would make these. So this is just the construction phase, so that's the um, base of the, um, of the um, fishway. Over here that's the river, that's upstream of the barrage, so the river's behind this um, and then the, the barrage is over here a bit. So that's the base of the fishway. And basically these precast concrete channels, which were just culverts, upturned culverts, and then they put um, these baffles in between them, bolted it all together, and the baffles had the little slots in there. One of the other things we did with this fishway is that they lined it with rocks. And the reason they did that, and I'll go into this fish in a minute, it's called a chupong or a freshwater flathead. And as the name suggests, it hangs around down the bottom and it swims on the bottom. And it's not a particularly good swimmer. So we really put these rocks in for that species, plus others, potentially eels and stuff, but for that species in particular, so that it could get into the nooks and crannies and find its way upstream because it's not a particularly good swimmer. And that's the completed fishway in eight days. So it took from the day they started digging to the day it was completed was eight days, which, which is pretty amazing compared to some, the, the way we'd normally build these, which would usually take months. So once we've done that, we go in and monitor it. And the reason we do that is, you know, you build these fishways, we've got to make sure it's passing all the fish species we, we designed it to. And um, we do that by monitoring. 
And we do it by trapping the fishway itself. And we also undertook some boat electrofishing downstream of the fishway um, to see what fish species were down there and make sure that they were all making it to the fishway. So the first part of uh, the sampling was this trapping. So this was a custom made, that's the concrete channel there. That's the baffle separating them. And this was a custom made trap that fitted into it um, neatly. And in here, there's a funnel set up that goes through that opening in the baffle. So fish would swim up through here, get into the cage, and we had these rubber um, feather type things to stop fish finding the exit and back in. And so the fish would hang around in here. And what we'd do, we'd, um, we'd set this at the entrance of the fishway and at the exit of the fishway, and we compare the diversity and abundance of fish in both. So if the diversity and abundance wasn't the same, we'd know there's something wrong in the fishway, and we go and have a closer look and um, find out why they could get to the entrance but they couldn't get to the exit. It means there's something going on in the fishway that the velocities may not be right. And there's things we can do to tweak that. We can bolt on um, you know, bits of aluminium to the slot widths to reduce them, to reduce velocities and things like that. Uh, oh, the other thing we did with that, we also um, um, compared the length of fish. So fish swimming ability is related to the length of the fish. So the smaller the fish, the poorer their swimming ability. So you look at the length of the fish at the, at the exit of the trap of the same species, and then of the same species below, you look at the length and you compare them. And if they're smaller at the entrance and then they are at their exit, you know there's something wrong because you know the small guys can't get up to the top. So there's something wrong in the fish way and you go and have a closer look and make sure um, that it's all work. It's all you know, working to specification. And that's usually around the velocities and turbulence levels. So for that fishway trapping, we undertook, we um, trapped the um, fishway on 13 occasions and on each occasion over two days and we would do three um, entrance trappings and three <coughs> exit trappings. And all in all, we found 16 species of fish utilising the fishway and that included 14 native and two alien. This is a list of those species here. Um, and we found that pretty much all the size classes and all the diversity of fish that were getting to the entrance or getting to the exit and all the size classes were good, except for one fish, and that was this uh, flat-headed gudgeon. And these are notoriously bad swimmers, and everywhere we put in fishways, they tend to um, not be able to make it up until they're about 40 mil long, which is not that long anyway. But that did come out that we were finding fish about 25 mil at the entrance that weren't getting to the exit. Uh, but apart from that, all the other size classes of fish were getting through. Um, so, look, you know, to actually get that, um, change that fishway to be able to get them to get through would cost a massive amount of money. So, look, the ecological consequences of those small fish not getting through are probably not huge. And, um, you know, all these other ones are getting through, which is a really good result. Here's just an example of some of the fish we're getting through. So, yellow-eyed mullet... Um, at particular times of the year, particularly in autumn, we are getting hundreds of these fish and adults going upstream. So that was a really good result because, as I think I mentioned earlier, one of the objectives was hopefully to get mullet and larger body fish species up there and hopefully get some sort of fishery going for the anglers. So that was we're pretty happy about that. This guy here, this is um, the chupong or the freshwater flathead I was telling you about. That one there is an adult female. So just a little short life history on these guys. Um, the, the females grow to about that long and they go upstream into fresh water and the males only grow to about that long and they stay in the estuary. So the females go up into fresh water and they remain there for about um, three, four or five years um, and then they move down to the estuary to spawn and they go through the estuary and out to sea and we never see them again. And we don't know if they spawn in the estuary or they're spawning out to sea and we're presuming they, we presume they die after they spawn. So, yeah, they only spawn once, so the, the females are hanging around in fresh water four or five years, only come down once to spawn, spawn in the estuary or the sea, and then they've gone. Um, we never see them again. And we know that through tagging them. This is another fish species that we got in there. This is a nationally threatened fish species called the Australian grayling. This fish was once in the 70s considered the most threatened freshwater fish in Australia. Um, thankfully, that's not the case anymore. But this guy here is an adult, and basically this is a schooling species, and they live in fresh water. Um, they form big schools in fresh water, if there's enough of them. Like I said, they're threatened, so you don't often see the big schools. But, um, yeah, so they live in fresh water, and then in autumn, in fact, right about, right about now on a high flow event, the adults come down towards the top of the estuary. They don't actually go into the estuary, but they stay in fresh water, and they have big spawning congregations. So you have a big spawning event. Following that, the adults all move back upstream into their um, adult habitat, freshwater habitat, and the little guys go out through the estuary, the larvae, 
Um, they hang around in the sea for six months. Six months later, come up through the estuary and back up to fresh water where they remain for, the, uh, rem remain for the rest of their lives and start the whole cycle again. And we got lots of little juveniles going through the fishway, which was fantastic. And keep in mind, you know, in the last three... We started doing this in 2012, and in the last three years since we've been doing it, there have been no drown-out events. So none of these fish species would have got upstream in the absence of that fishway. So none of them at all. None of those fish would have got through. Um, and this is the, some, other, some of the other species we're getting. So these are the um, galaxids. There was three species of galaxids we're getting. Um, spotted galaxid, broadfin galaxid, and um, common galaxid. Common galaxid were by far the most abundant. And literally, we would get tens, at the peak of the migration, we're getting tens of thousands of these fish going through per day. And if you extrapolate it out over the entire migration period, there's millions of them going upstream. And keep in mind, none of them would have got up if that fishway wasn't there. And you can imagine millions of these things going upstream, just adding to the productivity and the diversity of the river. So it's a really good result in itself too. So just the last bit of um, my talk, and that was the boat electrofishing, which was part of our sampling. And the reason we did that is you can imagine when you put a fishway on a weir, all this water's going over the weir, and you have this little fishway entrance to the side. And sometimes it's really difficult for the fish to find that entrance, because they usually follow the flow, and usually the majority of the flow isn't going down the fishway. So what we did, we go down and we boat electrofish down below it. And electrofishing, those of you guys who may not know, it's about putting an electric current in the water. It stuns the fish. It doesn't kill them. We can collect them, weigh them, measure them, and then um, tag them if we want, and then release them unharmed. So, yeah, so we, don't, we do the boat electrofishing to see what fish species of fish were below it, to make sure all those ones that we thought should have been getting up the fishway were actually finding the entrance and getting up, up there. So that's why we und um, undertook that. This is the boat electrofisher that we used. This is actually the only one of its type in the world. It works in salt water. Um, we made this prototype um, in conjunction with a German manufacturer, um, and it works really, really well. And like I said, it's about the only one. It is the only one in the world at the moment, but um, it's the sort of thing over the next few years will take off because up until now, electrofishing only works in salt water, uh, in fresh water. So we, this was the electrofishing unit we used. Um, and we would boat electrofish on every occasion. After we'd finished sampling the fishway, we'd go down and boat electrofish to see what species were down there. We found 20 species of fish below the fishway, and these are the guys here. Um, and none of the species we found down there, uh, a lot of them were just estuarine species, and you wouldn't expect them to use the fishway. So none of the species we found down there did we worry about thinking, why aren't they using the fishway? Because they were purely estuarine species you wouldn't necessarily expect to. And they included things like brim, um, estuary perch. There's a really diverse and abundant fish, you know, population of fish down there, which is a real shame. You know, imagine that estuary all the way up to Geelong and these sorts of things. Trevally, lots of salmon. You know, you see massive schools of salmon there at certain times of year. It's just literally tens of thousands of them. Uh, Luderick, sea mullet, mulloway. Certain times of year you have mulloway coming in. Sometimes they weren't there. You come, sometimes they were there. So it would all vary. So what's it all mean? Well, the bottom line is it means the fishway is working really well. Um, it's great to see that we have got mullet moving. We've got all those small species going through, no problem, barring those little um, gudgeon. But that consistently happens with fishways across the state. And the, the ecological consequences of that are probably not that big a deal, you know, particularly when you're, the trade-off is all these other species are getting through. And, you know, the cost of trying to build a fishway to get them through would you know, probably triple it. Um, so it's working really well. We've got mullet, as far as angling species go, we've got mullet going through. We haven't had any estuary perch. That was the other um, angling species we're hoping to get through. We're not saying they're not getting through. Um, ours was a small window of sampling, so it is possible that they were getting through and we just didn't catch them. Um, so we have had some reports of Australian bass or estuary perch caught from upstream of there in recent months. Now, whether they are bass or perch, we're not sure, but they may well be perch, which would be a great sign, because if they are perch, they're coming from downstream. And it'd be great to see them establish a population upstream. So just in summary on that fishway, look, removal on that weir, the removal would have been the best because it re-establishes the estuary upstream to its historical um, area around Geelong. But the fishway was a great cost-effective way to um, re-establish fish passage. And we've got a really good, diverse and broad age um, structure of fish upstream. And that's it. And just special thanks to Dennis and Wayne from the CMA, particularly Dennis, who really drove that fishway um, getting built.